Hi, loose end from yesterday. I thought we could do one more example problem. Um, this slide came immediately after um, a slide in which we used our new theorem to determine for this polynomial function um, on what intervals it was increasing and on what intervals it was decreasing. And this uh, is because we now know that if the derivative of a function on a certain interval is negative, the function is decreasing. But if the derivative is positive everywhere on that interval, then the function is increasing. And this example that we gave is the, the simplest example uh, possible, basically. Uh, it's um, a uh, polynomial, and even when you take the derivative, it factors nicely. So it's, it's easy to to find out um, exactly on what intervals um, the derivative is positive and negative. Okay, so there are some harder examples. So here's here's a harder example, which is still, however, totally doable. Um, here is a function, cosine squared plus sine. Okay, uh, goal, tell me on what intervals this function is um, increasing and on what intervals this function is decreasing. Okay, so we are going to take the derivative. The mean value theorem uh, enabled me to prove these uh, incredible facts, uh, not incredible, but these very useful facts um, about the relationship between differentiation, between the derivative of a function and, and that function. So I take the derivative. Of course, um, perhaps it's even better to rewrite this function one more time uh, as what it really is, which is cosine x quantity squared plus sine x. That makes it obvious that I have to use the chain rule. And uh, because the outer function is the squaring function, the inner function is cosine. So what is the derivative of cosine squared? Well, the derivative of something squared is 2 something back inside for the derivative of the something. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Uh, plus um, the derivative of sine is cosine. OK, so yes, that did require us knowing the chain rule and the derivative of sine and cosine. But mm, I hope you'll agree that uh, in this case, doing the differentiation, the whole thing that we spent all of March on, is now just kind of like a small little piece of the problem. What is really uh, required now is to use this differentiation. And how? Um, well, I need to know uh, when this derivative is positive and when it's negative. So now I have a, a pre-calculus problem essentially on my hand, which is to analyze this derivative and find out when it's positive and when it's negative. OK. Uh, well, fortunately, we, we know how to do this. What is this derivative? I'll rewrite it um, uh, maybe uh, nicely one more time as, well, OK, I can factor out a cosine, right? So this is cosine times 1 minus 2 sine x. And if that's my derivative, so this is the version that I'll put a box around. And now um, I need to know, yo, when is cosine x uh, over 1 minus 2 sine x, uh, when is that positive? I, I asked the question, when is it positive? Of course, when it's not positive, it's negative or 0. So that, that kind of answers both questions. OK, well, this is what I would consider to be a hard problem. Uh, most pre-calculus students in America you know, would, would struggle to solve this. But uh, it's something that we did in pre-calc C. Um, so in our, uh, in, at the very end of, of quarter one, we um, solved these sort of advanced uh, trigonometric inequalities. And there is a whole sort of procedure to this. What, what is the procedure? Well, we break this. Uh, maybe it's actually better if I do this over here where there's a little bit more space. So cosine x times 1 minus 2 sine x. I want to know when is that? Uh, positive. Okay, uh, so what do we do? Well, we use um, logic. Uh, I have a product of two functions, and I want to know when that product is positive. Well, that's going to be when they're either both positive or both negative. So um, I need to now sort of solve the separate smaller problems. When is cosine x positive, and when is 1 minus 2 sine x positive? Okay, so let's do that. When? Well, when is cosine x positive? This is easily done because uh, I can make a picture, and using the definition of cosine involving the unit circle, cosine is the, the x-coordinate. And so cosine will be positive all of these places. Boom. And when is 1 minus 2 sine x positive? Well, that's going to happen whenever 1 is bigger than 2 sine x, which is just another way of saying whenever sine x is less than 1 half. 
So, all right, when is sine x less than a half? Again, I make a picture of a circle, unit circle, and I use the definition of sine. What's the definition of sine? It's the y coordinate. When is sine one half? Uh, sine is one half over here, pi over six and five pi over six. So, oh, oops, so sine will be less than one half when the y coordinate is less than one half. In other words, all this stuff. Okay, and now I sort of need to combine the information contained on these individual unit circles. And to do that, I make one big unit circle. It's also possible if you are an expert to just have skipped these intermediate steps and to just go straight here. And uh, by go straight here, uh, what I mean is um, uh, on this unit circle, I will combine the two pictures I already made. So this is a little redundant, but okay. Uh, and so uh, I having sort of overlapping uh, shaded concentric circles, I now can see at a glance that uh, here at pi over six, uh, something is happening. Here at pi over two, something is happening. Here at five pi over six, something is happening. And here at, at three pi over two, something is happening. So um, the when red is shaded, it means that cosine is positive, this factor. When the green is shaded, it means that um, 1 minus 2 sine x is positive, uh, which is the, the other factor. And now I can look at my picture that I've made. This is just kind of organizes my, my thinking. And now I'm going to make a sign chart um, for the derivative. And I want to do this only on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, because the period of this function is, is 2 pi, so whatever happens is just going to keep repeating. Okay, so here, um, not necessarily to scale, is pi over 6. Here is pi over 2. Here is 5 pi over 6. And here is 3 pi over 2. So this is a relatively difficult uh, pre-calculus problem, in, in my opinion. Uh, okay, and now, looking uh, at this picture, I see that on the interval from 0 to pi over 6, I've shaded red and green, which means, according to my convention to shade positive, that both of these factors are positive, so therefore the product is positive. So, boom. And now, uh, on the interval from pi over 6 to pi over 2, uh, the red is shaded, but the green isn't which by our convention means that this factor is positive, but this factor is negative. So if one of these is positive and this one is negative, it means the product is negative. Okay, going a little faster now, on the interval from pi over two to five pi over six, neither of them are shaded, which means that both of these are negative, which means that the product is positive. And um, from five pi over six, uh, to 3 pi over 2, the green is shaded, but the red isn't. So that means this factor is positive, but this factor is negative. Therefore, the product is negative. And back to 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, they're both shaded, so they're both positive, so the product is positive. Here I have now sort of converted this picture, uh, and I think this is really the best way to do it, back into a sort of linear uh, thing. And now, all right, I, I guess we're just kind of done, so maybe uh, um, just let's just say that the, the whole point of this was to determine, I didn't explain what the directions were on the top of this page, but the directions were find out on what intervals this function f is increasing and decreasing. And so here we see, because the derivative is positive, um, f is increasing here on the interval 0 pi over 6. And here f is decreasing on this interval. Here f is increasing on this interval. Here, f is decreasing on this interval, and here, f is increasing on this interval. And so this is a very powerful uh, theorem that essentially tells me uh, when a function is getting bigger and when a function is getting smaller. And uh, of course, from this, I can also determine uh, where the relative extrema are. Um, if this function, since this function is increasing here and then decreasing, then that means that this is a relative max, that f has a relative max uh, at uh, x equals pi over 6, okay, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, and uh, I guess I'm done. The last thing to say is that really um, this whole process kind of depends on my ability to, to analyze the, the sign of the derivative. I guess I said that already. All right, good. That was a little example. Hopefully that was under 10 minutes. Um, goodbye.